Thank you, uh, Vane, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. It has been, for me, already two amazing days. I've heard so many new takes on old subjects and old takes on new, new uh, subjects. Met wonderful people, have very nice conversations. Um, and I'm sorry to, have, uh, to be the one closing these uh, two days. But that's how it is. Um, I'm talking as, let me see how this works. Yeah. I'm an archaeologist. I'm a little bit of a stranger to the field of anthropology and uh, ethnography, although many of the museums that I criticize, advise, teach about, um, would qualify as ethnographic collections of eth or ethnographic museums. Um, I will pick up a theme that I discussed 10 years ago. It's about memory of the Second World War. Um, and there's something funny and painful about it in this country, the moment that we change generations of people who are eyewitnesses to people who only know this, this um, um, root identification story of Europe um, second hand. It also has an implication for the way museums deal with reason, sub reason and further remote history. Um, so, especially last night, um, Barbara's um, amazing musing on memory, history, remembering and commemoration was right at my heart. I'll do a four-step approach. I um, do some musings about the nature of time. I want to talk to you about paradigm shifts. Of all the 18 speakers, only one has, has used the word paradigm. I will be the second. And then a big problem, the orphans in storage, one of the biggest secrets of, muse of uh, museums in Europe. And then a proposal for a biographical turn in which museums become cognizant of their own biography in order to deal with their audiences and with their collections, whatever they may, they may be. So bear with, bear with. Twenty years ago, <laughs> yes, you may laugh, I was waiting for, an, um, I think, the mayor of Leiden to open an uh, exhibition in the museum I was working in then, the Rijksmuseum van Oudheid, the National Museum of Antiquities. Um, and I was waiting at the, at the, at the door, um, together with a Roman soldier, a, a reenactor. <laughs> I can't help it, but it, 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 it's, it's what it is. Um, and um, a neighbor passing by on his bike stopped and without being asked or provoked, he confided to me, not knowing who I was, do you know, mister, that it's all stolen goods in this museum? I didn't know actually, but uh, 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 shortly after, I, 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 I found it quite interesting that someone took the trouble of, in his own street, in his own city, reminding me of the fact that he thought that the content of one of the big national museums in our country consists of stolen goods. My family, I used to take once a year around Christmas on a guided tour in that same museum every year. And my mother is now 86, 20 years ago, she was 66, not so old, I say now. Um, and after each guided tour, she asked me, without any hint of humor or sarcasm, sarcasm or irony, wow, that was very interesting, Reamer. Did you guys excavate all this? She had no idea, really. And she's not, she's not a dumb woman. She is like, she reads a newspaper. She, 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 she has an intellectual career. She has no idea how to relate to the material culture stacked in the Museum of Antiquities as I worked in and that she was familiar with. This is something we as museum people really have to keep in mind. There's a major conceptual bridge between what we think is our everyday reality and what the people who pay for it and who we want to come and enjoy it with it and think about what we're doing and what we're having. Two months ago, in the city of Utrecht, 
and a new kind of museum opened, built around um, a Roman ship found there 10 years ago, completely restored for an extraordinary amount of money. You see it on the right upper hand side. The museum is part of a theme park, it's called Castellum, not very surprisingly. You see the size and the, and the volume and the proportion of the thing on the right uh, uh, lower hand side. And what my point is, you see some of the utensils being found inside this Roman ship. And I'm a classical archaeologist, so I went there with like 40 colleagues last week. And I saw for the first time cast iron carpenter utensils. And all of my colleagues and myself were astonished by the fact <coughs> sorry, that we were not able to tell any difference between what must be 2,000 years old and what could have been made in a shop yesterday and sold today in a carpenter shop. <coughs> this is a kind of negation of the historical sensation that our uh, national historian Huizinga was so proud to, uh, to muse on. There was no historical sensation. There was a paradox. This we could have bought yesterday in a shop at the corner. The same um, mechanism holds for a museum that was um, inaugurated in 2000, no, remade in the 1994 in the Belgian city of Tongeren, dedicated to the Romano uh, British, I would say, like Romano Gallic uh, culture of that, uh, of that place. And they staged it, staged it as a theater, which I like very much. And what's more, they didn't um, dissimulate that there were very many things inside their collection that had no idea what it was about. So this Dodecaeder and 12 uh, parts uh, volume, um, they, they decided to make it into the symbol of the museum. The point is, they said, and I was, I'm still impressed by it, the Neolithic, the prehistory and Iron Age, especially Iron Age, is not an age, but it's a way of living. And this way of living and being just continues until today. Just walk out of the village, look around you, see how people deal with their environment, with their animals, with um, husbandry. So, what we, we went there with the whole National Museum of Antiquities in order to prepare for a major rehaul of our own museum in the late 90s. That's where I got the uh, uh, example from. So, uh, what they did in Tongeren was they exploded our linear view of history because they said it could also be this. And, we, I, and I'm still impressed by it because it's a total different uh, way of dealing with history. In my, in my field in archaeology, this is anathema. You don't do this. You have very clear epochs, eras, phases, periods. There is no way they would intersect or, 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 or they would accumulate. I'm a little bit artistic trying to kind of make, 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 make a focus in this long durée, real long durée of prehistory with like an, 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 an apex like around the, uh, the beginning of the Roman period. And actually, this continued red line of the Roman period, going into pink, illustrates why there is this paradox of us seeing these Roman utensils in this Utrecht Museum that could have remained yesterday, because this kind of technology just continues. Talking about agency of uh, objects. Good. These were the introductory musings about the nature of time in the kind of museums that I work in. Now let's talk about paradigm shifts. Foucault, of course, created this wonderful idea about episteme, which is um, not a knowledge, but a way of uh, dealing with reality in everything, in rhetorics, in signs, in words, um, and um, in images. And the whole point is, of his, um, the use of the notion of episteme is this, the successive stages, in this case Europe as um, a theater, um, from going from one episteme to the other, 
is kind of a paradigm shift, but it makes it impossible to think back in terms of the previous paradigm or previous episteme. And he, um, he um, 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 filled in um, the boxes of his epistemi um, by calling them similarities, differences, and processes and functions, respectively, or Renaissance way of dealing with the world is seeing the world, perceiving the world, and interpreting it as God's wisdom in hidden relations, as opposed to the classical one and the modern one. I don't want to go too deep into this, this would be a lecture. We don't have time, but I give you one example. There's a wonderful ostrich egg cup. It's meant to be drunk from in um, the Vienna Kunsthistorisches Museum, part Kunstkammer, made by one Clement Kicklinger, a uh, goldsmith in the 16th century, <coughs> and is now being shown only as an extravagant showpiece, which it is, more than half a meter high, and you don't know what it is. Well, it's an ostrich carrying her own egg on her back. And she's um, uh, led by a moor, very small, um, um, through, an, uh, through a chain, and she's holding a uh, horseshoe in her, in her beak. Um, and the whole thing is um, decorated with pieces of coral. That would be the factual description. But the people in the 16th century saw something completely different. They saw a symbol, what we call a symbol, but, we, but they um, must have perceived as a presence, a fingerprint of God in nature. Because an ostrich leaves her eggs, expects her time, know when the time is full, the fullness of time has come. So she is an emanation of um, the Virgin Mary. And, uh, Classical tradition had it that um, the egg uh, hatched without the intervention of, uh, of the bird, and this was equal to the mirac miraculous uh, parthenogenesis of the Son of God. So this kind of, in, and you, you notice that I have difficulty in, in, in formulating it, because it's a different paradigm, because it's a different episteme. We don't have the words to describe the values or to describe actually what we're seeing. Even the Cartesian way of me describing something is from after this period. Good. This paradigm shift of paradigm jump, or paradigm, paradigm dive, in which you forget how to express yourself in the terms of the previous one, is part of an absolutely fascinating new for me, new field of inquiry. It's the memory studies and then the forgetting side of it. And I just quote two amazing authors, Paul Connaughton, um, late, late 90s, wrote a book, How Societies Remember, forgetting as a way of dealing up by societies with various parts of their pasts. And the annulment or the paradigm shift in this uh, seven, Tier system of forgetting by Paul Connaughton is precisely the, um, the um, paradigm shift as I was talking about. It's also a gift, the paradigm shift, because you don't have to remember what other people did without, outside of your paradigm. We don't know anymore that Newton, Isaac Newton, wrote more on alchemy than on signs. We just forget it because it doesn't fit and we don't understand it. Second, oh yeah, um, just to give one example, a very nice one, because I'm a classicist and I'm going to share it with you, of one of these institutionalized ways of forgetting, is the institution immortalized by Aeschylus in the Oresteia of the Areopagus as a high court for um, blood void. Um, it's at the beginning of society as we want, wish to remember it, this beginning. Um, in which blood void is being, um, by intervention of the, of the gods, be, uh, being stopped and overcome by the institution of a high court. We solemnly declare to forget the wrongs done to us by the institution of uh, laws and uh, legal, um, legal systems. 
and perhaps even more um, um, famous uh, way of system of thinking about forgetting is, was, uh, is by Aleida Asman. Um, last year, she um, got a uh, very prestigious um, Royal Academy in Heineken Prize uh, award um, in Amsterdam, and she had a, a masterful uh, acceptance speech on the way you can deal with the various forms of forgetting. And her um, third form of forgetting equals our paradigm shift. Just to, uh, just to bring back to you the idea about it is you cannot see the two images here at the same time. You either see the rabbit or you see the duck, but never together. It's a classical, even from the ninth, late 19th century, rabbit-duck illusion. And Thomas Kuhn used it as an image for his, um, for his study into the uh, structure of scientific revolutions. Good. What does that have to do with what we're doing in museums? A lot. This is my own work, like an illustration of what I think that uh, Foucault meant, because Foucault does not go very much into, uh, into, into museums. Um, but we know all that since the Renaissance we have um, um, brought together collections, and you may assume that many pieces in your collections um, echo the, the cultural values of that particular time, of that particular e uh, epoch, going from Renaissance through Enlightenment to modernity and postmodernism. I just give you an example of the cultural values that lead us to acquire or to uh, disacquire uh, some uh, some object, like this famous root loft in uh, the biggest uh, cathedral in our country. It was sold in uh, 1873 to the, to the later Victorian Albert Museum because a 17th century classicist Rudloff has no place in a Gothic cathedral. That's what the value of the time was. We would uh, be hard to underwrite this kind of choice. The point is, the objects in our collections are a mirror of these changing value systems. And the point is, when the value system disappears, the objects do not disappear. They become orphans. Only the last ones we vaguely remember. So what we are stuck with in the end is a kind of timeless, orphaned, unknown, ununderstood, atemporal capsule of an eternal now. There's a tragedy in it, and for researchers, and um, un incomprehensible riches to go explore. Um, I give you one, of two, one or two examples. You must believe this. It's interest, more interesting, like a museum of the typewriter, a museum or a collection of biocriminological, chronological um, items, like the head of the nice young man looking at you, or a museum of wooden agricultural utensils, or a museum, and I make no joke here, that uh, when I started working in the 1998, uh, had 500 iron cast stoves in its collection, and the director decided one Sunday night, half a, half a year after he uh, co was commissioned, to just put them at the garbage, except five. And he said, he told me, no one noticed. <laughs> But there used to be, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, a typology of 7,000 technologically innovative types of stoves. That was the ICT of the time. In the middle you see what used to be um, the wet dream of any Dutch cultural uh, person, a picture of a cow. It's not anymore on the height or the, or the pinnacle of uh, art history, but it used to be in the 19th century, early 19th century. Low down you see um, a uh, 3D image of a uh, crystal as state of the art in 1813. Since then, the whole science has evolved, but we're still stuck in some museums with hundreds of these outdated 3D models of crystals. What the left side is is too long a story, I just skip it. 
even the gypsum or plaster collections in our museums do not come from museums, one or two exceptions, but they come from art academies because they were used to teach people how to draw properly. Actually, that's also the background to the arch architectural element in the Rijksmuseum because it was for young architects to learn how to properly build an early Renaissance late Gothic uh, piece of architecture. The most amazing thing that you can find, and I'm going to go slightly out of my, my, my one or two, two minutes, because this is a real ethnographical issue. Um, in 1910, one Kleiwecht de Zwaan, an ethnologist, did somatological research in the island of Nias. He cast faces of 1300 islanders, all young men, sensual of no, no, no women there, perhaps he didn't dare touch them. That can be one of the cases. Um, and since then, as you might know, um, um, somatology, chronology, and physical anthropology has uh, become a little lackluster. So those are orphans collections of the highest degree. But the Rijksmuseum decided by the refurbishment of its new building in 2013 to display 42 of these heads in a kind of artistic E installation in the part of the uh, 1900 to 1950 um, exhibition of the 20th century without telling us why it's there, what is it, why, what, what use it is. And I need this to bring you to the core of my, um, of my presentation, which is whenever a museum or a museum institution is confronted by this layered collection, layered in time, layered in values, it should, do, it should make transparent at least four things. The physical facts, whatever facts are, height, width, measures, where it comes from, what date it is. Second, what was the original purpose of its production? We call that first context, primary context. Second, why did it enter ever into a museum collection? Which I call the intention of first museological use, the process of musealization. And then you can leave as many steps or put as many steps in between because uh, the longer you wait, the more in between steps there will be. But in the end, there must be a legitimization of its actual context. Why is it now where you, where you see it? And what moral, political, societal issues are there to address? If you don't do that, you are not uh, doing justice to your own intelligence and that of your audience. This is what I teach our students, very simple. And part of that is the conversation with the people who went before, we call it the predecessors or the previous people, which is by the way, very, the title of a very famous Dutch um, essay by Menno ter Braak. By engaging with the biography of your pieces, you go into dialogue, in a conversation with previous generations. If a museum wants to not hover above or outside time, it's good to be a platform to engage in that conversation. If it doesn't, then you have to explain something. Okay, what means that for bio biography? The former director of this wonderful institution, I know, I have to, I have to say this, <laughs> Stephen Engelsman is now the director of the uh, Weltmuseum Wien, and he says, this enormous collection in Vienna, which has been closed for, 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 12 to, uh, for, for 20 years, I'm going to revive in order to make this conversation visible again. I'm going to present the pieces as messages, as symbols, as the materialization, as the embodiments of the relations Vienna had over 500 years with the rest of the world. So it's to be a biographical institution. And I give you one example, these funny two, sadly coming from the Benin area, um, dancers, I think they are, were, were um, bought by one Georg Haas in the late 19th century, offered to the emperor who gave him um, 
an, uh, an, uh, a title. This is the kind of micro, micro anecdote that you need to know in order to appreciate the reason why it first came into the museum. It doesn't say that is it a just uh, uh, enough justification for it still being there. But let's talk about that. And the last one is um, the same kind of approach. I'm advocating for the uh, renewal of the Wereldmuseum in Rotterdam, which has a very sad history the last few years. But one of the re things you can do with that collection is put it into this biographical perspective. Just tell the stories of very rich uh, entrepreneurs, scientists, um, who were equals of the rulers of like Jogjakarta and who got in this exchange a kind of present and brought it back to Rotterdam. And then it was part of either the Wereldmuseum collection or the Boymans collection. So my last question is, what can we do to avoid our collection from becoming messages in a bottle because we forgot the contexts and value systems? Thank you very much.